Thank you very much. Gorgeous Stockholm welcome. Thank you. Welcome. First of all, of course, congratulations on the Stockholm Achievement Award. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, what does that mean to you? Well, this, you know, it's a... Uh, this is a, I'm not just saying this because you're all here. It is a great city and I, I love it and I've had a lot of splendid times here over the years coming to visit and talk about films and Sweden is a place I've had a chance to work. So, uh, um, so I have many happy memories and to be, you know, I get to do something that I love. So to be uh, recognized for it by a great festival like the Stockholm one is entirely unnecessary. <laughs> but it's very nice. <laughs> so it's very nice indeed, yeah. Yeah. And you will leave this country with a very heavy horse. So I hear that the weight of the horse has been, <laughs> has been told to me from all corners of the globe, from people who have been lucky enough to receive it, yeah. yeah. Uh, I must admit that my English is a little bit rusty because uh, I recognize it was uh, b before the pandemic, the last time I was talking mm. to an English English-speaking person. Mm -hmm. So you are the first one. All right, great. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I wonder, what about your Swedish? Did you catch any Swedish yeah. during your time in Eastad? No, no, no. I mean, I spent the whole time. I've got two mates here from the Volanda series, actually, uh, Ted and Andreas. Give stand up, boys. Got it. Two excellent <laughs> filmmakers. I hope, boys. Good. So we, well, uh, we got. So we met about 15 years ago, and about 15 years ago they tried to teach me some Swedish, and they're still trying. Um, so I still, I still mispronounce Ustad, so sorry about that. Um, so I have, there you go, you see, I have no, no gift for Swedish yet. But, you know, so there's yeah. plenty of time. It will come. Yeah. Uh, soon we will enjoy your beautiful film Belfast, and it's about your childhood in Belfast. But before that, I want uh, to ask, wh when did you come into acting and uh, theater? Um, well, um, after the events of the film, eventually my family moved to, uh, to England, and uh, it was at school, uh, in school plays, that um, I understood, I, I found something that I enjoyed enormously, and um, you'll see, actually, the, the, the kid that you see in the movie, watching films uh, became with no idea of how you did it or how you could do it. In, the, in a way, Belfast represents the enormous journey that anybody can make sometimes to, be, to end up being a storyteller. It certainly was a very a big one for me. And a big stage was, was discovering that I loved acting. And for me, it, was a, it became a vocation quickly. So uh, in school plays, I, 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 was, I enjoyed it. I had some teachers who said that you could do this for a living and that there were things called drama schools. I had never heard of them before. And so um, once I understood that there was maybe a way to do it, uh, I pursued it with, with passion, uh, with just the idea and hope that at some point you might be able to work in a theatre somewhere. Never anything more than that. I would have been very happy with that. Uh, but So it was something that caught my heart and my soul when I was 15, 16. And uh, I understand that this story, Belfast, you have had it in your mind for many years, and it was actually the pandemic that made you made it. Well, during the pandemic, you really made it. Yeah, I think the um, you'll see that the events of the film are... Um, uh, you know, they're really about a moment that was really uh, the, the end of childhood. You might describe it as sort of the last day of my childhood. Uh, people who've um, seen the film talk about the, the, it's speaking to them about the moment before, um, uh, well, in quotes before, uh, when maybe innocence is with a young person and for all of us, there is some kind of moment, sometimes it is peaceful, sometimes it is not, where a transition is made to some sort of the beginnings of adulthood. The way it happened for me was very, very um, literally violent. And so um, for about 50 years, the, the, uh, yes, this um, preoccupation with that event and what it did for my character uh, and, and what it did to my, to my parents and the sacrifices they made. Uh, I suppose it never went away, this idea that there was a particular moment 
frankly, about 20 seconds where my life changed, quite uh, literally. And so um, it's, I think the, the relationship to it has never gone away. At the beginning of the pandemic, I don't know what it was like for everyone here. For me, what I was struck by was the deep, deep silence uh, I have a little dog, I walk the dog all the time, and so uh, there were no airplanes in the sky, there were no cars on the roads, and what came into my head was the sound of Belfast. And uh, during this 20 min seconds, minutes, seconds, seconds, I seconds what, what happened then? Uh, well, I don't want a spoiler alert here. Um, <laughs> I would just say that there was a, a sort of... A, uh, I would say a, a surreal experience of, of, of believing that you understood one thing and then something else coming to pass. So there's a, the sense, uh, we come from a very large extended family and, um, and so the, um, uh, there was a sense of security, I would say, that um, I've come to value from that moment, from those 20 seconds, uh, you know, I, we changed ultimately, ultimately, after many adventures, because I don't want to spoil the film for you as well, we changed sort of where we were, what we did, who I was, how I sounded. And, you know, um, I think there are moments when children have to become sort of uh, secret agents. They have to become sort of spies in their own life to somehow, sometimes work out what the future might be. So one way or another, it took 50 years to understand whether that story could be something that was of more interest to, to, to anyone than, than just me. And, and, and um, I think the pandemic allowed me to um, understand how to tell the story, I think, in a way that could allow for moments of recognition from people um, you know, in other parts of the world um, and, and not be just a piece of uh, personal therapy for me. The, the little boy in the movie, Buddy, mm -hmm. yourself perhaps, mm -hmm. uh, he loves to go to the cinema. Yeah. Yeah. Was it the same with you when you were a little boy? Yeah, it was very... Um, the world of the cinema was a... Uh, and I love this cinema, by the way. This is a real... Uh, you know, you, the feeling of possibility is here. Um, so, and also... And I, I haven't said, but I will say, thank you very much for coming here tonight, because the, the, um, the sense of uh, all of us gathered in a crowd to watch a, a film or have any kind of communal experience is still relatively uh, new again. Um, and I personally have always really, really enjoyed and responded to it. I still go to the cinema a lot. I'm a really, it's, it's, a, it's a genuine hobby and passion, and it doesn't feel, as we would say, like a busman's holiday. It's something that I carry from my childhood, because uh, we went as a family, and uh, the movies felt very immersive. My, the Belfast I lived in was, if you like, quite a sort of monochrome world. Uh, it, uh, it rained a lot. I'm sure it doesn't rain in Sweden, but it did. Uh, oh, it does, perhaps. Um, it does, certainly rains in Belfast, I can tell you that. And, uh, and so I kind of, I suppose, saw that world in black and white. Um, but uh, the movies that I saw were these big, widescreen, technicolor, immersive experiences. Uh, and so they took me to places that um, you know, I'd never heard of. It was an escape, it was magical, it was... Um, and also, in a way, as the, story, the events of the film pr proceed, it's a kind of way for the, for the child to try and navigate his way through life. He doesn't have much at his disposal, he's nine years old, so he knows about football. Um, he's got a passion for a girl uh, that is not being reciprocated. Uh, he's, got, he's got religion. You'll see what I think about that. Um, and, and he's got the movies. So the movies were often ways of um, reflecting stories back to us. Um, and particularly, uh, we'd often go to the cinema cinema to see big color films, but at home on television, which is black and white, um, just three channels, that's where I'd see old black and white movies. Sometimes there were color movies broadcast in black and white, but often westerns. And in what happened in Belfast in the summer of 1969 that was the beginning of something that would be known for three very, very dark decades as the Troubles, there was a sense, at least through the eyes of a nine-year-old, uh, that the world could be a little like a Western. 
Um, certainly, certainly, it seemed like there were a lot of cowboys in Belfast and, and, some, and some bad guys, yeah. Do you remember when you went to the cinema for the first time? I think, bizarrely, the first time I went to the cinema was to see a Beatles film, you may recall, uh, called Yellow Submarine, yeah. uh, which is a very trippy movie. Yeah. I think, uh, I believe that movie was made with the aid of substances that were not, that were not strictly available to, to, to children. Um, but, and I think it lent it a very, uh, you know, sort of, really uh, sort of bizarre air. So it was unusual animation, fantastic colors. It was quite funny, quite dark, quite surreal, um, and, but very, very, very engaging. And in fact, those Beatles films were, were, were part of what really you know, drew us in. We were very aware, it was a time when we were very aware of uh, you know, the sort of cultural sizzle. I mean, I couldn't at nine years old you know, dignify it with any sort of great understanding, but I knew that people spoke about, and we could see on the news, a sort of cultural phenomenon. Um, so the Beatles and British music was exploding all over the place. In San Francisco, it was the Summer of Love. In 1968, the year before the Paris riots, students had been rioting in Paris. The very day on which this film began, for real, on the 15th of August, 1969, was also uh, the weekend at which the Woodstock Festival, famous pop festival of legend, took place in New York. So there was something, there were a lot of, um, it felt like the world was being shaken up. And I was very aware of that in, in, the, uh, in the films that I saw and, and, in, and in the culture, such as I was able to take it in as a young person. We will talk a little bit more about <clears throat> Belfast later, but I, after you, played the theatre in school and after school, you joined the Royal Shakespeare Company. Mm -hmm. And how did you discover Shakespeare? Well, it, actually through movies, you know. I, we, we, I saw a film, uh, you may know Julius Caesar, Joseph Mankiewicz's version of that. Marlon Brando played uh, uh, Mark Antony. He was very brilliant in it. James Mason uh, was in it also. So we saw that with the school. We went to a cinema and I found that very real. Um, it, I, could I could understand it, not fully, but I was very engaged. Uh, but what was more um, sort of immediate, we went uh, in a packed house like this to see Romeo and Juliet, uh, and the first thing, in the theater, and the first thing we saw was a sword fight. We saw sparks coming off the blades, and it caused a near riot. I was watching it with a, you know, a theater full of 13-year-olds, so we were you know, the, the boys were, testosterone was flying all over the place, and then, and then Juliet came on and was absolutely gorgeous, and then, they, you know, we got very silly about all of that. Um, and, um, but also, because I had come from Belfast, um, I was very aware of this sort of, um, the world of tribalism, a, a kind of polarizing of things that, alas, the world has much experience of right now. Um, uh, there's a line in the film when a character says, you're either with us or against us. Very simplistic and brutal way of looking at uh, allegiances. Anyway, one way or another, the visceral impact of Romeo and Juliet and the sort of knowledge of that uh, kind of um, situation, a religious one in, in Belfast, but in this case a family feud, was uh, immensely engaging. And one of the things that was... Uh, um, sort of uh, that drew me to it was that I, I felt it, but I didn't understand it, so I wanted to understand it, so I studied it, and then I wanted to be able to take it back. Once again, this film, Belfast, will, will perhaps explain a little about the way I've approached Shakespeare, for what it's worth, um, which is um, trying to find a way to be direct and let it speak to people as it spoke to me um, very... Yes, very directly, and as I suppose I would hope it might speak to my family, who otherwise, like many people, would feel that there was a divide between them and Shakespeare, or between them and so-called great art. And I think um, my experience growing up was that there need not be, and that I preferred it not to be. One of the things I admire about the Irish, the Swedes are like this as well, actually, is that they can have conversations about philosophy and football. There's, it's sort of, people talk about a lot of things. People don't mind getting deep quickly. That's what I've discovered with a lot of Swedes, by the way, um, is that people are, you know, they're engaged, they're, 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 they're open, they're, you know, they're, and, and, and subjects are not excluded. So for me, that's how I wanted to work with Shakespeare. I wanted to make it, um, as, as available as, as it seemed to me it was. 
Um, and so uh, experiences of it being very passionate in the theatre uh, were important to me. And the first film as a director, it was a Shakespeare play, mm -hmm. Henry V, and you put yourself in the leading role. Yeah. Well, I was, I was cheap, I was available. Um, I didn't give the director any trouble. I was so, uh, I was very easy to work with for the director. Uh, but I think mainly I was cheap. Um, yeah, the, the, I had, at the Royal Shakespeare Company, I played the role. And we met a, uh, you know, life is full of interesting chances. We met with a producer, a would-be producer, who was very passionate about uh, getting into the film business. And he, you know, one night, um, you know, I said, this guy, I'd begun to see the story in pictures. You know, I played it from the inside. I played it for about two years on the stage. So, I don't know, 150, 200 performances. So I felt as though it was in my blood. But I also knew that I, 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 I as you'll see, <laughs> my, my uh, vocabulary was actually as much visual as it was uh, literary. So uh, that was the beginning of, of, of trying to work out how to make classical literature or classical work um, that is sometimes dialogue heavy or dialogue dependent work in a medium that depends on images and I believed you could do it and there would be a, a very interesting marriage that wasn't just photographing people talking. I, I first time I met you was actually in Cannes 1993 mm -hmm. for another Shakespeare play mm -hmm. Much Ado About Nothing, mm -hmm. a comedy mm -hmm. and I remember that you were 33 years old, in a very good mood, <laughs> very easy to interview, and the reportage were received very well in Sweden. Do, do, was that the first big festival for you? Uh, I think it was, actually, and um, it was a film that was blessed with sort of sunshine. The play itself is a full of an amazing sort of heart, I would say. Uh, it's only a really an actor's instinct, but, but uh, again, having been in that play many times... Um, uh, I, feel, I feel Shakespeare enjoys those characters very much. I feel that he likes the company of Beatrice and Benedict, who are the two central characters, who are two people trying desperately to, to not reveal that they love each other. And although there are lots of dark elements in that play, it's, very, it's a silly, giddy, funny energy that runs through it, and a big heart, big heart. And I would say a more romantic heart than in many of Shakespeare's plays. He is, he is tough, but he is less genuinely cynical. I think in that play, he believes in love, believes in the power of love. Ian McKellen used to do a one-man show about Shakespeare, and halfway through, he would ask the audience if they knew anything about Shakespeare, and if they did, he would ask them to name a Shakespeare play in which, he thought, in which they thought there was a, a happy marriage or a happy ending. And uh, because he believed that there wasn't. He didn't believe there was a single relationship in Shakespeare, loving relationship, that ended happily. Um, I don't believe that, but interestingly, the one couple that would be quoted by people um, uh, who answered that question uh, were the Macbeths, um, who, are both, um, who, who are both murderers, but they have a very happy marriage. Okay. Now, some people might say they have a happy marriage because they're murderers. I don't know. I would not agree with that, but uh, it's, one of the, it's one of the quirks of Shakespeare. Yeah. Is it uh, any of your films uh, that are especially important and dear for you? They're all especially important and dear, because I'm sure we probably have some filmmakers here tonight, and they'll all know, well, I know uh, uh, Andreas and Ted are, uh, but um, they'll, they'll know it's a miracle to get any film made ever, anytime, anywhere, under any circumstances. That's my experience. So the fact of making one is already a very bonding and memorable moment. So they're, they're all, you put an equal amount of, um, of, of passion into them. Um, they're, they're, they're beautiful, privileged things to do, but they're very, very stressful to, to make. There's so many variables, uh, but, they're, but when you get a chance, I mean, it's amazing to me, it was always amazing to me to see a full house here about to see this film. That's as good as it gets. So it's, it's, uh, you'd, you'd wish that for every film you make. Unfortunately, I've, I've been in a few of my films when there aren't anybody, aren't anybody there or very few people. And so I know which version I prefer, but I love them all the same. And uh, do you have a, any role that you are very happy about? Uh, that I have played? Yeah. Um, 
Well, uh, I really, uh, I mean, for me, the role of Hamlet in our full-length version of Hamlet, we did it on 70 millimeter, and it was four hours long, and we had an amazing cast, and that was a, you know, a sort of lifetime um, privilege to be able to do such a thing. That was um, absolutely amazing to be involved with that role, because it's one from which you learn, you are in the shadow of its greatness, but it's, a, it's also an amazing play, a great story, a great revenge drama, a great thriller, um, a great ghost story, you might say. This part of the world knows plenty about Hamlet. Um, and my, all the times I played it, including uh, up the street there at Elsinore, I had the chance to do that. It was a great, again, life thrill. So that, that part, um, as, uh, like, like a good dog, it's given me much more than I could ever give it. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's go back to Belfast. It, uh, time is flying. Uh, Belfast, 1969. Uh, <clears throat> and I saw the movie the other week, and I was very moved. It was a lot of laughs and a lot of tears. Mm -hmm. But what was it like for you to go back to that time and Belfast? Uh, um, well, I, I, you know, I'd been thinking about it for a long time, and um, I think the... Uh, um, Writing it came out in a sort of flood, I would say. And one thing that I determined to do was just not, not second-guess myself. So it's a very uncensored piece of work. I don't try and... Um, I wanted it to be raw and have a, an intuitive and instinctive quality. Um, I wanted to have the, the joy and the laughter that uh, Belfast people have, even in the darkest of circumstances. Uh, and in making it, we were so thrilled, we were so lucky, we made it out just out of the first uh, lockdown in England. So we were the, we, there were only two films making, um, being made then. One was Us, one was Batman. We were the first two films back. And uh, we were aware that we were so privileged to be able to do it. And we didn't know how long this gap was going to last. And in fact, it, it literally lasted for the length of our shoot. And then we were locked down again. Um, so we, we went into it with this sort of sense of immense... Uh, the precious nature of the time meant that um, we really committed to enjoying it because we knew how lucky we were. And it wasn't until really post-production and until the end of the process that the emotional weight of it kind of hit me. Uh, and that hit me, you know, quite sort of profoundly, as perhaps it might. But mostly what hit me was the the real thrill at understanding, which I hope happens tonight, but it's all right if it doesn't, um, that... that uh, it spoke to other people, that there was recognition in terms of childhood, families, the little political situation, the larger one, um, some of the way movies, you know, affects us all. So, uh, in a way, the, the, the experience of doing it became something much, much, much more sort of, wi you know, wider than my own personal desire to understand, which I suppose it was, something that happened um, a long time ago and that has haunted me ever since. Yeah. And how do you feel now after when the film is done? Uh, well, I think uh, full, I would say, full. Um, and uh, I think the story of a film is an, is an evolving thing. Um, I've always been interested to bump into people who've seen the films. They're usually very honest, you know, people are very straight with you if they like something or don't like something. And, you know, you learn a lot. Um, I, it's, I always feel as though, and it's dangerous with something like this, it can feel quite sort of memorial, you know. It's another film. It's very important to me. It's very personal to me. But so is Hamlet. So is Henry V. You know, these are, these are all, I think... This is an overtly personal film that I think ends up, I hope, having some universal sort of reach. And I've made other things, you know, picture like Thor uh, for Marvel, you know, is a, is, a, uh, is, is a movie just as personal to me about fathers and sons, even though they are fathers and sons who wear very colorful clothes and ride horses over rainbow bridges across space, um, which we've all done, obviously. Um, <laughs> But uh, it just is a different form. It's a different scale. It's a different size. Um, but I think that, um, you know, you... you I, I, listen, I'm proud and I'm enjoying the moment. I cannot tell you how excited I am that uh, you're all going to see it. For me, that's... Uh, I mean, it's amazing. I make films for audiences. I make them for audiences. So if I can, you know, paraphrase badly Jerry Maguire, you know, you complete me. Uh, so that you certainly complete the film. Yeah. 
it's a, in one way a, a very idyllic word for the little boy and also very scary with the fights between Protestants and Catholics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's very interesting to see. I must um, ask you about, we shall hear if anyone in the audience has <coughs> questions for you, but I must uh, ask you about uh, some scenes when during the night when men walking along the street with torches. Is it, wh why do they? Uh, because what happened was when, when everything changed, um, the world, the, 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 our immediate world became like a sort of Wild West town. So they were effectively vigilantes. They were our own men, our own neighbors patrolling the streets. Um, some of it, a lot of it for show, uh, but, but also because there was a lot of machismo that was being flung around, even though the women, thank God, ran everything, but they couldn't protect um, against the worst excesses of the stupidity of the men. But the, uh, there was nevertheless this kind of, you know, inevitably a sort of citizen's army, quite aside from what became very rigorously structured political groups. But this film deals with a moment when it was much more in flux, when people were trying to sort of make up what you did when civil war came to call. Yeah. Uh, let's hear, is it anyone out there who wants to ask Kenneth something? Oh, they're all out there, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. <laughs> There's a hand there. Right there. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so nice to see you here, and to, uh, really looking forward to seeing the film. And uh, you said that when you, you directed yourself as being actor and director, then it's good because the actor won't give the director any hassle. And I wonder if when you, when you write the movie as well, then I imagine there's a very easy relationship between the screenwriter and director as well. But what's the, what's the biggest challenge being both screenwriter and director? Uh, very interesting question. Um, I think, uh, you know, you've got to be, the big challenge is being sort of rigorous and honest. And um, to be honest, uh, I was in this film. Uh, I played an older version of the young man that you'll see. And I was, you know, I was in it throughout. And then uh, there was a, a big sort of homecoming at the end. And so the director had to talk to the actor then and say, I'm afraid you're not going to be in the film. Uh, sometimes I've had to write notes to actors apologizing when they've done excellent work, but for some reason it hasn't fitted into the whole scheme of things. Uh, in this case, I can't say that it was a particularly hard decision. It was just it didn't, it didn't work. But I think the, basically that rigor that honesty with yourself, you know. And then when you look at yourself, uh, you know, in performance, um, you have to, be, you know, in an editing suite, you have to be very um, rigorous about that. I, I also work with a lot of very honest people. Una, uh, who edited this film, has done two or three pictures. The, I'm with people who have no problem letting me know if they don't think the work I've done is up to standard. So um, the, if you're smart, you'll listen to people who are more talented than you, and you'll take, the, you know, you'll get some advice. Do we have time for any more? One more question? Ooh. No. There you go. There's, there's a hand over there. Yeah. Oh, there's, there's a hand right there. There are two hands. Yeah. I wondered whether you had been influenced by any other similar type of genre. Um, and if I can just give you an example, um, one of my favorite films, but I can't remem remember its, its full name, but it's by a, um, a, a Liverpool uh, film uh, director, uh, and I can't remember, it says Davis. Ter Terence Davis. Terence uh, Davis, still uh, lives. Dis distant Voices, still lives. Distant lives. Voices, still live. Beautiful film yeah, about the violence within the family and growing up in really Liverpool after the Second World War. And I, I just wondered that there are other films like that. I just wondered whether that played a part. I realise the facts are totally different. Um, no is the answer. No, no specific ones. Although there are there are what, what I'd call memory films or the memoir films that I do love. A real favourite of mine is uh, Louis Malle's Au revoir, Au revoir les enfants, which I think is a really a beautiful, beautiful film. Um, no, I would say if you, I suppose one film. It's not. It's not. It isn't the subject matter. But one film which was a big inspiration to this was an excellent Polish film called Ida. You may remember from. Uh, probably five years ago, by Pavel Pavlikovsky, 
Uh, it's a really a magnificent movie, and uh, there's something about the aesthetic of that film that was, was a great inspiration to this. But on the whole, I stayed away from um, uh, other memoirs and just tried to listen to this particular story, which I knew wasn't going to be. 50 years on and through the eyes of a nine-year-old, it's not going to be documentary truth because um, there is no objective truth. You know, people, people can have breakfast one morning and argue that evening about what went on. You know, this, the, the, same, the same thing happened, but two different points of view eight hours later, uh, you know, dispute things. So I, I let that part of what memory does play out as it would. Thank, Thank you. you very much. I, I read somewhere that you said uh, uh, that you can take the boy out of Belfast, but you can't take Belfast out of the boy. Mm -hmm. what, what do you mean by that? Um, I think, you know, some of uh, what the film does, at least for me, is, is uh, and maybe we all have these experiences of, of trying to work out, really, whether it is important to have a relationship with your birthplace. Does it mean something or nothing? Um, the people you grew up with, if they are unhappy memories, does it, is, it, is there any point in... in um, considering it? Uh, or is it, as the Irish condition has it, pretty important? Because um, the, the sort of a, a sense of home runs through and a sense of belonging runs through the sort of entire cultural kind of um, landscape of, of the art of that, of that island. So I couldn't resist my questioning about what home meant to me. And I think it, you, it, it kind of it embodies the phrase that you quoted there. I think Belfast is still... 100% in, in this boy. Good. Thank you very much. And now it's time for the prize ceremony. So welcome again, Gibbs. <laughs> well, uh, Mr. Kenneth it's an honor to have you here. So this year, uh, Stockholm uh, Achievement Award is awarded to a creative, multi-talent man who has made an amazing artistic journey from Shakespeare to Valander and Oscar nomination as a director, actor, writer, producer, poet, and songwriter. With Belfast, Branagh show off his masterful sensibilities as a world-class storyteller. It's a great honor to present the Stockholm Achievements Award 2021 to Kenneth Branagh. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. It's, it, thank you. Thank you. It is. Wow, it is heavy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Um, wow. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that, thanks very much. Listen, I know you, you've been so kind to come see the film, so I, don't wanna, I won't keep you for much longer. I will let you know this is just as heavy as everybody says it is, uh, so that's going to be very useful at home in all sorts of ways. Uh, so um, I'll say no more. Um, Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Git. Thank you to the festival for having me. Thank you for this. Thank you all for being here. And after all, you know, that we've all been through uh, over this last year or two, I, I cannot tell you really how grateful I am to be in your company. Stockholm audiences have always been very, very generous uh, to my work. And, uh, and indeed, this country uh, and this city has given me so many, many great moments. Um, so to have the honor and the privilege uh, to work in your amazing country will remain for me a personal uh, and career highlight. Um, I think this city is, is, in my experience anyway, is throbbing with creativity, vitality and generosity. This film festival is one example. Uh, and I love it and I'm, I'm very delighted to be uh, back and to be in the company of such previous great recipients and weightlifters of this, uh, of this trophy is truly a thrill. And as my mother would insist on having us uh, say, thank you very much for having me. Um, thank you also to Universal uh, International and Focus Features for making it possible for us to be here. They've really been the greatest of partners um, in the journey to make this film together. Uh, and to bring it to you here, and I thank them very much indeed. I'm so lucky to be able to do what I do, so to be recognized for something that I love is, is, is something that I really 
deeply appreciate. So thank you, Stockholm. Um, so to the film, as we've been talking about, you know, I grew up in a place where it seemed to rain a lot, uh, but there was plenty of sunshine in the hearts of the people. We laughed a lot about silly things, uh, and really, please feel free to laugh tonight if you are so moved. Um, and we held each other when we cried about serious things, and generally, as a community, we were there for each other, for everyone. And then, as they say, things changed. So what you're about to see is the story of something that happened to me when I was nine years old and which changed my life forever. It also affected many, many other people in profound ways that reverberate to this day. And I've been waiting and wanting to tell the story for 50 years. And over that time, just repeatedly hearing the cacophonous, beautiful sound that is Belfast in my head. And at the beginning of the lockdown, for reasons which I think will become clear when you see the film, I knew that finally, after half a century, attention must be paid. So after 50 years, I really listened and I wrote down what I heard. These events take place in a great northern city on the island of Ireland a long time ago in a place called Belfast. Thank you. Thank you. Hey. Thank you. Whee! Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm going that way. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Right.